when people learn that I was a 911 dispatcher for three years uh, at my previous job, I get a different, some different reactions depending on who they are. Sometimes they you know, walk away. Uh, sometimes they look, look, give me looks of derision, especially in the climate toward police departments these days. I often get asked, what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened? Or what's the craziest story that you heard? Or, hey, did you hear about that chicken nugget, nugget drive through emergency? It was on YouTube. Thing is, sometimes I feel ashamed about working for the police department, especially in today's culture. I have stories about the weirdest thing that's ever happened or the craziest story that I've ever heard, kind of in my back pocket, ready to go to answer those questions. <laughs> yes, I've heard about the chicken nugget em drive through emergency on YouTube. And I'm here to tell you that it's kind of boring as a previous dispatcher, right? Like, you can go look it up, and it's like, oh, that's funny. It's not really funny. I've got a better story. You can catch me in the hallway. I'm glad to share it. The thing is that there's no real good stories that come out of being a police dispatcher because it's so rare that you get the full arc of the story that actually occurred. Dispatch, police dispatch, is right at the very beginning of an extremely large criminal justice funnel. It begins with somebody picking up the phone and calling 911, usually, and it can take months, years, sometimes a person's entire life to go through completion. So as a dispatcher, you get like this little tiny nugget at the very beginning. So I'm not here just to tell stories about 911 dispatch, although that would be super cathartic for me. I'm here to tell stories that illustrate um, how my experiences in dispatch and the, some of the techniques that I learned either by training or, you know, through the, the gauntlet of fire, as it were, right, have helped me to become a better user experience designer. I'm currently the UX director uh, for TenUp. We're a web agency doing uh, enterprise websites, solving that content management system problem. Um, and I use these skills every time, uh, every day, right? For me, my experience as a 911 dispatcher was extremely formative, uh, and I hope that some of these stories uh, help you understand how to build better software yourselves. All right, so the slides in the background are not tied to the talk, as you can already tell they're there in case you get bored of listening to me talk. Um, <laughs> And they also are there to give you a sense of the place. This is, the, this is what I could find on the internet. Dispatch is kind of a secretive thing. Police departments don't like to share information, so it was kind of hard to go back and piece together some of my three years there. Um, but I want to give you a sense of where I worked and some of the stories and, and things that made the news, some of the things that were happening, uh, things we found funny or annoying, right? Uh, also, a trigger warning for this talk, I am going to talk about uh, my perspective as a call taker, answering 911 calls. Uh, dealing with uh, subjects such as attempted suicide, violence, weapons, and chihuahuas. If any of those things make you uncomfortable, no worries. It's about a 40-minute talk. Uh, and then finally, I've always wanted to say this. Um, all suspects are innocent until proven guilty by the court of law. <laughs> right, no, in all seriousness, these situations that I'm about to describe, they took place uh, a number of years ago. There's no personally identifiable information. If you do happen to know anyone that was like, actually involved with this, please talk to me, because I want to know what happened. <laughs> One of the most important skills for a UX designer is the ability to conduct user research. Our goal is to build software for humans. I, that's actually been a recurring theme, which is pretty cool, right? Like nobody's building software for extraterrestrials yet. And even if you were, you would still want to interview them to find out what they need, right? And generally, this means a lot of user interviews. And it means asking good questions to uncover the often unstated needs and goals of those users. And now if you're following along with like, hmm, police and unstated needs, you're kind of making those connections really, really quick. Um, but I'm gonna tell you a story that illustrates this. Uh, pretty, pretty broadly, the unstated part anyway. At a man who uh, gave me a call, was, this is 911, right? So uh, my recording, because we don't actually say this every time we answer the phone, my recording picks up, 911, what is your emergency? And, and this is what he says. I need an ambulance. Pro tip, no one ever says that if they just need an ambulance for a medical reason, right? Like, that's weird. Nobody says, I need an ambulance. They say, like, oh my god, there's this crazy car accident, and they go into all this, this detail about it. Um, and so that was like a red flag. Now, here's the thing about Scottsdale Police Department. We're a, we were a public, they are, I was, um, a 911 primary public safety answer point, 
uh, which means that all of the 911 calls originating in my city were routed to my call center and we answered them. If it was a police emergency, we would also do the call taking, asking the questions, and dispatch the police. If it was a fire or medical emergency, we would get the fire department on the line, they would ask all of the medical or fire department related questions, and they would dispatch the ambulance or the fire department. So I could have transferred this on to somebody else, but that's not what I did. I asked a very important question. Why do you need an ambulance? And his response was equally unsettling. Because there's a man who's shot in my apartment. Right? Which was like, poof, eyes open. OK, I'm paying attention now, right? Like, and follow-up questions to that that are equally open-ended and trying to solicit more information to uncover what really happened here. Who shot him? I shot him. Oh, great. Now I'm dealing with a potential murderer. No joke, right? And so we're routing the call to the police department. I'm getting address information, trying to assess the, the condition of the person who, who shot him. And this guy's continuing to give really vague and interesting answers that aren't making a lot of sense. So I keep asking open-ended questions and trying to dig deeper. And the outcome for the police department was probably the best it could have been. I was able to get him to put the alleged gun that he had down and go meet with the police officers with nothing in his hands. That means that he didn't get shot because answering the door with a gun in your hands is not a good idea. Um, and the officers were able to enter the, the building. And I learned later, right, because Again, answering 911 means your calls end and like, you don't know what happened. I learned later, because these officers were willing to share, they entered the apartment and it was lined with little airline bottles of alcohol that were empty. And this guy was very, very intoxicated. Um, so good, and incidentally, I really hope that they revoked his ability to fly commercial airline jets. Just saying. Um, good questions, questions to elicit more information are open-ended. Uh, they're non-leading. Because good questions like that get good answers. Let's take a drink of water. When asking questions, when talking with stakeholders, when talking with other developers, sending email back and forth and, and so on, plain, simple language might not win any literary awards. <laughs> um, but it helps. But it's easier to understand the intent, right? It helps uh, people understand what you were trying to say. Mariko hit on this uh, perfectly yesterday in her talk uh, about language. And I'm going to give some examples from, from my experience that are similar. Because police work is filled with jargon and codes and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. If you've, if you've looked at um, any of the police code lists, right, it's filled with 10 codes and three digit codes that, that are kind of hard to interpret and understand. And every police department kind of has their own way of, of modeling this. If you're on the West Coast, it's, it's derived from the Los Angeles Police Department usually. If you're on the East Coast, it's derived from the New York City Police Department usually. And then everybody gives it their own spin, which means every single police department has their own way of speaking in codes and nobody knows what each other is saying. This is illustrated by the following. In Scottsdale, the police code 907, which is 907, means an officer is in need of urgent assistance. This is contrasted with a 906, which just means, hey, I need some backup. When you get here, maybe it's a traffic stop, like just kind of hang out, watch the other guy, and we'll go get donuts afterward. 907 means, oh my god, get here quick, because I'm in like a fight on the ground and it's bad. Incidentally, in Scottsdale, the police code 1097 just means the thing that you sent me to go do, I've arrived on the scene. I got there, right? So you can go 1097, and officers will shorten this to just be 97, which means you can go 97 on a call and have a 907. That's a problem, right? <laughs> in Mesa, which is the city just uh, southeast of Scottsdale, a 907 is a disposition code. It means the officer got done with the thing that they were working on, and they said, go ahead and clear this with a 907. It just means I need to follow up with this person or this case later. Big difference. In Phoenix, which is just to the west of Scottsdale, a 907 is routine backup. Phoenix's 907 is Scottsdale's 906, and Mesa's 907 is nothing at all, right? This has critical implications. And, like, I mean critical in the most literal sense of critical. Critical implications when these police departments are working together, which happens on things like, you know, a cooperative DUI task force in the East Valley. 
Some more, uh, some more examples of this uh, would be vehicle descriptions. Uh, we are taught in police work, and I was actually taught this in private security before that. Uh, the security officers that are floating around, they might have learned this. Is a way to describe vehicles using uh, an acronym called SYMBOL, C-Y-M-B-A-L. It stands for color, year, make, body style, anything else you notice in the license plate. You don't need to write that down because it has no relevance for software development. <laughs> but I'll give you an example of what this sounds like because it's a consistent way of describing a vehicle. So it'll be like this. All units copy an ATL for a possible 390 driver. I mean, it's copying ATL for a possible 390 driver, northbound Loop 101 from Shea. It's a dark gray 2012 Toyota Tacoma pickup with wash me written in dirt on the back. Organ plates of 917 Frank King King, base clear at 1421. Right? Here's, <laughs> and that includes all of the, don't pause for that. That's like every day, guys. That's every day. Um, the, the, here's a, that was a contrived example to include all of those things. Here's, here's one that actually happened. Ready? This is a stolen vehicle. It's in downtown Scottsdale, a busy, busy uh, party Friday night or whatever. Um, and it's a stolen vehicle, so you, know, you, have to, you have to select the entire city. Everybody's going to hear it and broadcast this description to every single officer in the city, which is kind of fun. Oh, and it's copying ATL for a 1040 vehicle. ATL for a 1040 vehicle. It's a pink six-seater golf cart with a sign on the side saying, Bunny Rides Bouncing Club to Club. No further base clear at 1422. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, almost the instant I transmitted that, uh, I had the opportunity to switch back to my own channel and everything. The lieutenant pulls up, uh, uh, pulls up the radio, right? And he calls me, he's like, uh, base 3L3, can you 10-9 uh, the description? Repeat the description. 10-4-3-L-3 is a pink six-seater golf cart with a sign on the side saying, Bunny Rides Bouncing Club to Club. Straight face. 3-L-3-10-4 <laughs> and behind the vehicle. 10-4-3-L-3. <laughs> All units hold your, hold your traffic for 3-L-3 with a 10-40 vehicle at Goldwater and 3rd. It's a pink six-seater golf cart. One atom is restricted. <laughs> and that's how you do this. Common... Plain language helps audiences engage, especially those that aren't in your community to begin with, the outsiders, as it were, right? The acronyms and emoji that you use on a regular basis within your community might help build culture. In fact, they do help build culture. But recognize that every time you use one of those, acronyms, emojis, uh, uh, memes, whatever it is that's unique to your community, you're also alienating everybody who's not inside of it. And it sounds to them the same way that that police gibberish just sounded to you guys. Using a structure for your communication, such as uh, issues, bug reports, meeting notes, whatever it is, helps people fill in the gaps where they don't immediately understand what's being said. It gives them a context. By giving vehicle descriptions in the same way every time, if I didn't quite understand that you said gray, by knowing where it comes in the lineup of that vehicle description, I can fill in the blank and know that that thing that kind of was like Ugh, was gray, right? One of the strongest tools for a 911 call taker and for a UX designer uh, is to know when to not say anything at all. Letting silence create attention, and when the other person starts to talk, listening really carefully at what they're about to say, uh, is super powerful. The inclination for people to fill that void uh, is, is so strong, they'll end up you know, in incriminating themselves. Here's an example. I got a call uh, on non-emergency this time, and uh, so my recording picks up. Scottsdale Police, this is Taylor, how can I help you? And no joke, he put, like, actors to shame with how much he could curse over the next 10 minute window. It was, I wish I'd recorded it and like memorized this script. It was amazing, right? Like the, 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 the stream of vulgarity that went on on the other end of the line was incredible. Um, and I can't even begin to replicate it, nor would I if I, had, if I had memorized it. As he started to slow down over this course of 10 minutes, right? So he'd go for like three minutes and start to slow down. And I, and I just kind of, mm-hmm. And he'd start back up again, yeah, start back up again, oh yeah, yeah. right? And eventually, <laughs> he ran out of things to say, which is pretty incredible that he had distinct things to say the whole time. And he ended up threatening the officers that gave him a ticket. If I ever see officer so-and-so and officer so-and-so, I'm gonna kill him. 
pro tip, it's not a good idea to threaten an officer's life. I sent an email to those two officers, letting them know the person who said this, what they said, offered to give them the recording of the call if they wanted it, and apparently they went to the gentleman's house the next day to provide some customer service. <laughs> next time you're talking with a collaborator, a stakeholder, colleague, whatever it is, try asking an open-ended question, a good one, and let the silence run just a bit longer than usual. and see what happens. It's awkward, isn't it, right? Like, what's he gonna say? I don't know. Getting a call, okay, I'm gonna take this serious now. So I, I gave you the warning beforehand, and, and here we go, right? Getting a call from someone who, um, who's just attempted to take their own life or is seriously considering it is a really, really scary thing to be on a call. Now, all of our calls at a 911 call center can be scary things uh, to listen to, right? But there's something that, that is different about this particular caller uh, than the others. So I wanna give kind of an example, put this into context. Um, another really scary thing that can happen to people is intimate partner violence, domestic violence, and so forth. If you are in a situation like that, where you don't feel comfortable with the person that you're with, you don't feel comfortable leaving, they're not letting you leave the house, whatever it is, right, please talk to somebody. I don't want to diminish that. But for us in dispatch, it was a routine, sadly routine call that happened over and over again, to the point where the questions I would ask were the same every single time, and they hardly ever changed. What's the address? Is it physical or verbal? Are there any weapons involved? Are there any kids in the house? Are there any dogs? What's his name? What's his date of birth? What's he look like? What's your name? What's his date of birth? What's you look like? That sort of thing, right? Send two officers, dispatch within three minutes, done. Sadly, sadly routine. By contrast, every suicidal caller has unique needs and a unique circumstance, and these calls are what we call exigent circumstances. That means, that's a legal term, and what it means is that as a police department, we did not need to get a warrant in order to search your phone records to call the cell phone company to get an address. We did not need a warrant to enter your home. This is where your life is in danger. It's exigent circumstances, and it's serious. And it can unfold in a matter of minutes, and it can unfold in a matter of hours. And as a call taker, you, spend, you t stay on the phone for as long as it takes to resolve that situation and every situation was different. Okay, so September, this is the disclaimer here, September was National Suicide Prevention Month. I'm gonna extend that for three days because I can, and say if you are having feelings of depression, anxiety, whatever it is that, that makes you want to think that you're gonna hurt yourself or harm yourself or commit suicide, please call someone, uh, seek help. There's crisis lines, counselors, a friend, 911. Uh, suicide prevention line is 1-800-273-TALK. I'm available if you, if you feel comfortable talking with me. Um, but please reach out. The topic that we got onto is not suicide, right? The topic is knowing when to be quiet, knowing how to have empathy and communicate with someone and letting them know, or knowing how to control that conversation to a point where you're not pushing for information too hard, where you're listening to, to understand their needs uh, and so forth. The example of this um, had the best possible outcome, right? And I don't even remember how the call came in because I, I'm probably blocking it subconsciously. Um, this gentleman called and he, and, he, and he did say that he was you know, looking to hurt himself and he had a gun with him in his hand, which to anybody who's worked in suicide counseling, plan means having a time and intention are the things that are indicators of how much of a risk somebody is. Having a gun in your hand saying you wanna hurt yourself is pretty high on that list. Um, and thankfully, I was able to talk this gentleman into putting the gun down first, walking into another room second, talking to a police officer third, and he got the counseling um, that he needed there. Best possible outcome. But it's this, it's those type of calls are a push and a pull between asking too many questions too fast, having empathy to build trust so you can ask more questions, having empathy to build trust so that you can ask them to do, request them to do something, I want to disambiguate empathy and sympathy again, proffer yet another definition of the two. Um, because this is how I learned it, and maybe this is helpful for you, maybe it's not, take with it what you will. The way I learned it is that empathy is understanding someone's emotions 
more objectively, right? I understand these are the symptoms. This is how we can move you forward in your life, right? This is, this is how we can get you out of this, right? I can show you the light because I understand what this means. Sympathy is where I actually feel those same emotions, much less productive. If you have somebody who is depressed, it is much more helpful to understand why they might be depressed, how you can help them, where you can move forward, what their needs are at the time than it is to become depressed because two depressed people is much less productive. That's my proffer of a distinction between sympathy and empathy. If you disagree, I'd love to chat in the hallway. Um, okay, so getting off of that topic because that was a downer. Sorry about that. It's late in the afternoon. Working uh, in a 911 call center, like working in an open source community, uh, is this collaborative, like working in any community, right? Like any job anywhere, it's a collaborative thing. Within the call center, there's this intense collaboration between the call taker who's receiving the call and the dispatcher who's giving to an officer. It's critical that those two people, and then further on down the chain, the responding officers, the district attorney, whatever it is, that everybody understands the problem, takes ownership over the problem within their purview, and has agency to make change if they need to. Uh, the story that, that I want to tell is this great push and pull between, not push and pull, there was no push, this great exchange between myself as the call taker and my dispatcher. Um, I got a call from a, a lady on emergency again uh, who was very distraught. Her, she had just received a call from victim services. Her husband was being uh, released from jail that evening. He had been in jail, uh, been put in jail the previous evening for holding a knife to her throat, and she was understandably upset about this development. I have no idea why we were releasing her husband after less than 24 hours after doing this. But nevertheless, she had the foresight to call the police department, which was great. So I asked her a couple questions, um, two of which are important, right? Are there any dogs in your house? Yes, I have a few chihuahuas. Great, you can deal with chihuahuas. Are there any guns in the house? Yes, I've got his arsenal. Okay. <laughs> is there any place else you might be able to stay this evening? Maybe your house isn't such a good idea if you're concerned of him coming back, right? No, there's nowhere else I can stay, and I'm certainly not going to tell her that she can't defend herself, although not necessarily a good situation. I put in what's known as an FYI call for your information, and that just goes into the system. It links to the address so that, you know, if we ever pull it up, we can see it. It lets the dispatcher know what's going on. If any of the officers decide to pull up their calls, they could see it, but it's not going to get dispatched. My dispatcher decides to change that FYI from an info call. She's like, nope, I want an officer to acknowledge this distinctly. She sends it to the beat officer to go talk with this, this woman. Fine. Fast forward several hours into our... That's a fine picture of me, isn't it? Fast forward several hours into my shift, and I get a call on 911. Now, I'm telling the story, so you're going to make this link immediately, but I had no idea this was her on the other end of the line because she's just screaming, right? All I hear is screaming. Oh, he's here, oh, please, oh, my God, ah. So I enter the call with the 911 information that comes from using a landline, and we route the call. I put it in as what's known as a 415 other. Priority three, that's gonna send two officers within three minutes to something, it's some sort of disturbance, I don't really know what it is yet, and I'm working on gathering some more information. My dispatcher recognizes that it's the same address as before, and she goes, hey, that's the same address. I'm gonna send another officer, fine. She has the ability to change the situation, she has the agency to change that situation, is taking ownership over that call, right? So she keeps it as the 415 other and just adds another unit to it. So now three officers are going, and no sooner did she do that than I hear this, bang! Beep. Okay, so cognitively, <laughs> gunshot, right? And the beeping, I know, cognitively, does not mean that there's a heart rate monitor hooked up to the headphone and that was a flat line. <laughs> But what's going through my head and emotionally my response is that, oh my God, she just died, right? Scary. Um, the call gets upgraded to an unknown problem. All of the officers in the district are going as fast as they can. They'll have really big guns when they get there. And I still can't get her back on the phone. Hello, ma'am, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello, are you there? Hello, right? Nothing. Again. Answer, having stories as a 9-1 dispatcher can really stink unless you get some backstory, what happens afterward. Because that's all I knew for several hours, and I went on with my job answering calls and you know, whatever. 
Turns out the beeping was the carbon monoxide alarm in her house. The bang that I heard was a gunshot. Uh, it was not at her, which logically makes sense since she's the one with the arsenal at this point. She had fired a shotgun into the header above the door frame and uh, luckily for her, her soon-to-be ex-husband, I hope, um, he was not killed because it hit the door frame and not his head. Uh, the beeping was the carbon monoxide alarm, both from the, the smoke from the, the gun discharge, but also because the officers found some 35 chihuahuas in the house that had not been allowed to go outside for like three months. <laughs> some of you have dogs or can imagine the situation, right? Um, that also is what prompted the fire department to be responding, uh, to check the air quality, to see if the Arizona Humane Society could enter the house. Apparently the officers, because when you go to a call like this, you have to clear the house. So every single room you're checking to make sure the bad guy isn't there, right? Clearing the house. Um, apparently they were slipping on three inches of dog poop, uh, vomiting in the yard, it was horrible. The officers also decided to call the police crisis intervention specialists, both to check on this woman's mental health after having just tried to kill her husband uh, with a shotgun and also for the animal hoarding. Um, and those dogs were, of course, dogs and some other stuff, I think the slide has gone through a couple times, uh, were of course taken from her. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, less about an, in, an actual call and more just to talking about how, um, how our assumptions about what makes good software can be, can be just dead wrong. Um, ooh, bad pun, sorry. Ooh, dark humor. Uh, can, be, can be incorrect. Um, the, first, the first of these four is we had a system computer-aided dispatch, uh, several computers set up. Its main function is to allow you to enter calls for service, show you all of the calls for service that have yet to be dispatched, show you all of the officers that are not on a call, show you all the officers that are on a call, and a map, because maps are nice. Um, when I got there, after I got released from training, so about a year into my career, I looked at this. I was looking at this map, and this is horrible, right? Like I have some design sense, and whoever put this together, you know, the colors were just like all over the um, the map, literally. Over the, anyway, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, I put together a, a you know a proposal to change the colors to make it more design friendly. You know, like let's how many degrees of separation do we need? How many different colors? Let's keep them within the same hue, whatever it is. Let's make it calmer on the eyes and so forth. Got it approved by a whole bunch of different people, finally instituted in the program, and I forgot, or I did not understand one thing about how this map was used, which turned out to be kind of annoying for people. In our city, in Scottsdale, um, the city is very skinny, up to a certain point, and it becomes huge, very broad. Right? It's divided into four districts, one, two, three, four, as you go up, and each district is divided into a whole bunch of different beats, and those beats were what was colored differently. Right at the nexus between skinny and large was one beat that was colored the most, the brightest pink you have ever seen. It was horrible, I hated it. But it meant that when the map was way zoomed out, right, it's very small, and a pin is put in the map, you could see where the bright pink spot was, see where the pin was, and get a general sense for where in the city that pin was without having to look at any of the roads or the outlines or anything else, because the bright pink spot was your, was your reference location, was your registration for the maps, kind of geographical area. I had no idea. And it turns out that implementing a new color scheme for the map was pretty disruptive for a while. Second thing is building an intranet. Um, the first, right, first when I got there, the way the information was collated was we'd type it into a Word document, uh, maybe add some navigation at the top of that Word document, but you know, it'd be pages upon pages in this Word doc, and to find something like, you know, like what do you do with a dead bird if someone's asking, right? Like you'd pull up the Word doc, control F, type bird or something, right? It would come up with a bunch of answers, you'd hit return until you got down into the doc to the thing that you were kind of looking for. <laughs> not, not a brilliant system, but you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, I know, let's have an intranet, right? Like I know something about IA and you know, intranets and this is gonna be great. Uh, so I got the approval to, to build an intranet and that kind of blew up and eventually it's like, yes, we're gonna build a SharePoint thing and now we have two problems, a Word doc and SharePoint. <laughs> SharePoint's search feature is, is kind of the thing to highlight here, right? Like, and it's not just SharePoint, it's that I didn't really understand how the Word doc was being used even though I was using it. In a Word doc, you can hit Control F, you enter a couple terms. It tells you how many terms are matching, and you can hit Enter to see the full text result, one after another. 
as you go down, it'll tell you, it'll show you like how far down in the document you are, so you have a general reference of how far down you've got to go. In SharePoint, none of those things exist. You type in a search, hope it's good enough, you hit enter, a bunch of results come back, they give you tiny little <laughs> excerpts that may or may not be contextually relevant, and you click on the first one hoping that it's, you know, gonna be good enough. Not understanding you know, how things were actually being used led to our systems becoming a little bit more inefficient over time. Third thing is backup systems. Thankfully, I had nothing to do with this, but <laughs> in a call center like 911, as you'd expect, there's all sorts of backup systems. What happens if the power goes out, the radios go out, whatever it is, right? We have a backup system in place to handle that, which is great because it's a mission critical emergency communications uh, system. And I suspect that most of you working on various software components probably don't need the level of backup systems that we need. If the global internet goes down, you guys finally get to go out and go hiking, and it's great. <laughs> Maybe you will suffer from less burnout if that happens. However, I would suggest that some of your systems, some of your applications, some of your processes, some of your communities could benefit from a backup system of some type. What happens if the Main, uh, the main developer on a, on a software stack goes AWOL, just kind of disappears off the internet for a while. Like, does anybody have like a phone number for them, an address? Is there an alternate way to get a hold of them? What's the backup system for that? What's the backup system uh, if, you know, if, if GitHub disappears tomorrow? God help us all. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, Hopefully somebody has a repo cloned locally that's relatively up to date, and that's no big deal. Uh, and we can move on to whatever replaces GitHub. Um, you know, things like that. It's, some, it's, an, it's a thought exercise I encourage you to go through. Uh, and one that when the power was intentionally turned off uh, late, uh, late one night, so that we could upgrade some stuff, uh, and we were on a card system instead of a computer system and manual phones, which was odd. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a process in place, and it, and it was horrible. But you could get through it, because it was there. The last thing is that um, our CAD vendor, Computer Aided Dispatch vendor, um, like vendors of a lot of software, including maybe some that you're working on, love features. We all know this, right? And like, oh yeah, okay, we're gonna push back against features. Features sell their product, right? Like, they can sell you a dispatch system, it costs a whole bunch of money to get installed, and the only way they're gonna get you to think about them again is for tweaks to that system, because it's proprietary, and we're gonna like tweak, we, you know, we have to tweak it for your benefit, and we are willing to do that. Or, they're going to build enough features into their versions that eventually you will want to upgrade because of these features, and that's wonderful. But there's like this overlooked what is the actual feature that people want? And it's often overlooked. Like CAD has a number of built-in features that I described earlier, tracking units, tracking calls, and all this stuff. One that's often overlooked is speed, right? Like in 911 dispatch, it's, I could care less if I can right click on something and stroll to a contextual menu and click on a thing to open a dialog to do something with it. Never gonna use that. What I'm gonna use is this like horrible command line interface that you built into it because it's the fastest way to get things done. T, comma, 3L7, comma, Goldwater slash third, comma, 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 license plate, comma, state, right? And that's like the syntax for entering a traffic stop, and we did this daily. Add a vehicle to the call, ASUV, comma, T37 for the unit, comma, 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 something, I don't even remember it, my fingers remember it. In summary, uh, I've touched on a number of points about building better software. I've talked about asking good questions to uncover the unstated needs and the underlying problem. Uh, this gave the story of the, the man with his refrigerator, I think. Um, used plain language and structured communication such as the 907 uh, debacle and symbol for vehicle descriptions. I talked about sometimes how being quiet can provide the information that you're, you're actually looking for. Uh, you know, highlighted by this guy who was on the phone ranting a whole lot. I talked about how everyone in a project should understand the problem that we're trying to solve and have ownership over the problem to, you know, within their job scope and have the agency to make change as they need to, to build better software. Lastly, the software that you all write is absolutely meaningful. And I encourage you to go forth and write it, but writing usable and effective software is really challenging. I encourage you to do everything you can to help solve people's problems better. 
and you of all of the conferences that we could potentially be talking to are the right people to do that because you, unlike a lot of other people, really understand humans. Thank you very much.